Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Uncle Jeff Darrow is the guest of honor today as we take a look at uh, Richard Corbin's uh, first epic comic. Uh, and we're not talking about Marvel epic. We're talking about a standalone singular comic from Richard Corbin from the early 1970s. Ralph is under the microscope today. Uh, Jeff, before we jump into things, let the people know uh, about the impending Cruel to be Kin, Shaolin Cowboy trade paperback uh, that's going to be coming out pretty soon. When, when can people expect that to hit uh, store shelves? Well, thank you for asking, Ed. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's coming out. I, I looked today on Amazon. I guess on Amazon it comes out May 16th, and it's a hardcover, and it's, uh, it's, over, it's oversized. Nice. And uh, it's like the other the other hardcovers were, and it's it's two hundred more than well, two hundred some pages. I don't know how many with all the extra I, stuff. There's a couple extra pages that I had to add, so that there's the there's no chapter splits. It all kind of runs together. And uh, the first time I put some, I put in there like a, almost a whole little story that I storyboarded and never did. So you get to see my my goofy little uh, layout drawings. That's going to be yeah. That's really exciting. That's going to be really really fun to see. Jeff, do you look at uh, like like Cruel to Be Kin? You know, I've I've been following your work since Hard Boiled, and uh, I feel like it's maybe my favorite Shaolin Cowboy. Do you feel that way about it? I'm curious because sometimes I'll have a book come out. You know, I'll do a book and I'll think this is my best cartooning. Do you no, have that was, feeling right now on this new Shaolin Cowboy? Yeah, I was I was thinking I was wondering I was wondering if you guys feel that 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 way too because I mean, I mean we're going to talk about well we'll talk about some of the other things I've done but that that Shaolin is always the one that I like and this one in particular uh, I did some things I don't think I've ever done before and uh, I, I like it it's because I think it's funny and it's it's got some it's a little bit of pathos in it and uh, it, it, I got a lot of anger out in it as well when uh when the trade comes out and is available or if, or closer to its release or something we should we should get together again and go through that in the same fashion as we're doing with ralph and oh, just explore it and and go through the thing it's and send people your way to scoop that comic up because it is freaking epic man and and i've been following your social media facebook specifically and seeing that how you've been working on uh, this hardcover over the past bunch of months, basically since uh, since Japan, and uh, it's it's really yeah. cool to see. Yeah, I, I, I you know I didn't <laughs> you give me a lot more credit than I deserve. I, I don't I didn't do did do that much. I uh, I, I just you know I'm, I'm, I added I gave him this extra stuff. I'm very I I, I just want to bore people. And, Jeff, speaking of uh, speaking of Japan, though, like, uh, should we let Jimmy know that this is an intervention and that he uh, he, he needs to come along uh, <laughs> really next round? To, you really have to go, man. It, 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 you, were, you were really missed, and uh, you know, myself personally, it just it was so great to go with because because none of my none of my comic book friends want to go. My other friends, and it's just like, man, you know, how do you not want it? Because it's just such an it's so much fun, and it's. It's every day's a discovery, and uh, you know, and I, I love Japan, which isn't to say that I think some people it's not the ideal place in the world. I mean, it's an ideal place for me to visit. I, I love the place, but you know, it's just like like America. There's stuff I like about America and France, but they all have their their detriments. And but you would, gosh, I think you'd, you'd go. I'd just love to see your reaction to things. Yeah, I went in two, 2017, I think, was oh. the time that I went, and it, it blew my mind. Like, uh, I remember coming back, and, and the talk was, this really is like the comics paradise. Whatever I had in mind, whatever I've heard about Japan and manga and, and that scene, it surpassed all of it. And so, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with it a little bit, but certainly, like, going with somebody who's spent as much time there as you have, Jeff, would be amazing. And, and just going with comic book friends would be amazing because I had gone with my wife, so I got plenty of comic book action, <laughs> but uh, that wasn't the only that, that wasn't the only conversations that I had on that trip. So uh, a comic book tour of Japan would be the way to go. When we had that dinner with uh, Bob, I was calling call Bob again. Takashi Okazaki. 
yes. Afro Samurai. And my, and, my, and my friend Hero, who, who did uh, did one of the, I think Empire Strikes Back. Uh, I, th- I think he did the trilogy, Hunter. man. It, it was did definitely, th- yeah, it was definitely three Dark Horse trades mm-hmm. of uh, the Star Wars manga. But they, <laughs> when they when, when they were all going over who did what on Akira at some point. <laughs> and, and it was just, I mean, they were just, it was just really cracking me up. And as, as, as Ed, you remember, I kind of messed with them. Tell, uh, tell Jimmy what you did, because it's the meanest I've ever seen you be in, in my entire life. <laughs> well, I, see, I didn't think I was, I, 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 I didn't think I was being mean. I was just because they were going on. But, oh, if you look at the, you know, the angle of the window in this, you can tell like, it wasn't a Tolman. It's like, they're just going on and on about that. And it was kind of cracking me up. And I said, I think, was it, was it, Charlie, was it Peanuts that I brought up? Yeah. I said, well, yeah, it's like when Mobius was uh, was working on Peanuts, you can tell that the line work was was different, that it wasn't quite the... And they're looking at me, and they, they're they buying it. And I thought it was so outrageous that they... <laughs> and, and then we're like, Hero, he was... I think it upset him. Well, well you could... Ed, you're a better judge of it than I. I think I upset him. <laughs> well... Here's the thing is because like the way you explain it is like it was like a two second process, but like Jeff is kind of going on and on and, and, <laughs> and their jaws are hitting the floor as they're getting closer and more and more engaged and interested as Jeff is talking about Mobius's relationship with Charles Schultz on Peanuts. And me and Brian, I was actually feeling hot. I was like, oh, this is going on too long. Like, like there's a letdown that's going to happen pretty soon. And then, uh, and then when you revealed that it was a joke, like like heroes, he still he wanted to believe, yeah. like he, like he, he was really he was really it was a little he, devastated. He has, he has a certain naivete to him. He's a really <laughs> wonderful guy. And but they all they know me. They've known me long enough to know that I'm always well. I say that, but that's what I was thinking. I was like, okay, these guys are brothers because you can only right. do that to to a brother. But but, but, but I was definitely comment I like as it was happening I'm like oh man Uncle Jeff's being mean right now man because <laughs> like we, what it was like uh, this dude hero he he's super cool but of of course English is a second language and we were talking about how the line work in the last volume of Akira looks so different and uh, how in English translated interviews Otomo would always say that he like he had no assistance and shit and and hero and Takashi were like no nah, that's bullshit man and we were talking about Satoshi Khan. And he's like, no, you could tell that Satoshi Khan, like if you look at uh, World Department Horror, whatever that one is called, like Satoshi Khan has a piece in there and you could look at these window seals and it's the same window seals that are in the, the uh, Akira. But like, he's taken a long time to to describe this and then Jeff just fucking hit him with the atomic bombs. <laughs> it was, it was, it was uh, it's a George, George Foreman. It was, it was like, like glancing jabs and then he hit him with the fucking uppercut and then just knocked all the wind out of his sails. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, well, Satoshi Kon, have you, have you seen any of his? I don't know if and some of it has been, oh, he's amazing. Yeah. Yes. Holy cow. I met him on, um, uh, when I was there working on that Shaolin Cowboy film that never got finished. And uh, before, like, I may have mentioned this before. He, said, he, he like wore a cape, but he, he, he kind of dressed the part of, of what I call the artist. Uh, and, uh, but did, man, I mean, did, you can see, I mean, you can see in his comics. It, it, it's not a ripoff or anything, but but it's it's the school of Otomo, and there's not many guys that can can make that claim because it's just so hard. But he was, he was one of them. Yeah, there's it's like him. There's that uh, M- Mother Sarah dude. Yeah, there's that. Uh, that guy's a bit of a chameleon. When I yeah. mean, the stuff he's done after that, you can see it's the same guy. But that he really tried to do, especially in the vehicles and the the the, the backgrounds. Yeah. And then there was that guy who did that last gasp book, because uh, oh yeah, right, um, something that something tri- doorway that that trippy comic. Yeah, that, he was. That's a guy I know him, and he was an assistant on Akira. Yeah, because when I met him, he told me he said, "Oh, he said, oh no, no, I was I was an assistant." He goes, he goes, yeah, but he, he likes to tell everybody he did it by himself, which it's just we've talked about this. It's impossible. Yeah, impossible. That's kayfabe, man. Uh, Jeff, did it just with a pen. Right. Right, right out of your head, you still couldn't do it. Pro- probably the perfect place to remind everybody who's watching this video that we do have a video on Akira with Jeff going through and looking at some of these exact drawings and talking about this. So, and this uh, is Jeff Darrow talking to us, man. Like we, you know, you know what the line work looks like <laughs> yes, in a Jeff exactly. Darrow piece of art, and he would be the guy who could tell you 
if one person could do that piece or not, man. That, that was double page spreads. Uh, Jeff, have you? Did you ever meet Richard Corbin? I talked to him on the phone. How did uh, that happen, man? Did, did you? Did you well, make the acquaintance? You, well, I wanted to because I wanted to. I actually wanted to buy a piece of artwork from him. I just wanted to talk to him, and uh, because he was doing stuff at, at Dark Horse, and they, they 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 said they could give me his phone number, so I called him up, and we talked for fifteen minutes. But it was very. It was very nice. It was a very one-sided conversation. It was, it never, I asked him questions and he answered them. And it was very almost like talking with Mr. Spock a little mm, bit. That's what I hear. And, uh, I mean, if you want to talk about it, if you, if you could ever get Mike Mignola to come back to talk to talk to him about his afternoon with Corbin. It's it's a funny story and it's it's it's, it's a great. He's the only guy I know that's really spent any time with him. I When I worked at Hamburg Borough, I worked with um, Jim Stenstrom, who wrote uh, Thrill Kill, Neil Adams. And he did some stuff with uh, Corbin, and he, he he knew he he would talk to him, and he, he actually spoke with Corbin's wife quite often, and he knew him pretty much. But he you know he couldn't get him to come out of uh, out of Kansas. I don't really believe. I don't know if he ever did a show. I know he, at one point he asked uh, his wife asked if if what Richard. This thing of going to conventions, what do you think of uh, uh, San Diego? And when they say, oh man, you, know, you don't want to start out there. <laughs> that, that's, it's not really a comic convention at that point. And on top of it, somebody uh, that hasn't done a convention, that one, that one's a rough one. He is such an interesting comic book artist. Like so much of his work, it feels like his work is always a, a little bit elusive. It's hard. It's always out of print, it feels like. You're paying aftermarket prices for it. And I, you know, we talk about this a lot with artists, like that's up to him. You know, yeah. there was obviously demand. The fact that there weren't like cheap mass printings everywhere of his work was his choice, but it's so atypical in comics. Um, well, he, he was uh, a little bit reminded me of like, uh, they'd say about Orson Welles. Orson Welles never wanted to talk about his old films. He wanted to talk about what he was going to do next. He was always trying to get money for his next thing. Now, Richard wasn't like that, but he... I constantly say, when are you going to do Rolf to Dark Horse? And I say, he doesn't want to do any of that old stuff. He only wants to do this new stuff. Yeah, but again, so now it's going to start coming out now that yeah. sadly passed away. But he wouldn't let it because, I mean, my God, Rolf is like, holy cow. I can't, yeah, I can't wait to talk about it with you, man. Uh, my first discovery of Rolf was actually in this book, uh, Make Your Own Comics for Fun and Profit. It's, it's a book that I took out of uh, the local library constantly nobody else in the neighborhood ever got to see this book when it would get relisted i would just take it right back out we did a video on it this is a library copy and it is it is molested by whoever owned it which is just extra great here's a richard corbin piece from age 10 uh it's oh my this, God. this little dog drawing from his own comics that he trail comics he called it the feature's called the pup but that's richard corbin i think this guy knew richard corbin and the cool thing about this book is there is so much child artwork Here's a Jules Pfeiffer from age eight right wow. here. And then this is, you know, what Pfeiffer grows into with his uh, Village Voice strip there. But I got this comic when I was younger than almost everybody in here. Do you think Pfeiffer did the titling? Think he had some help on that? That feels pretty <laughs> advanced for an eight-year-old. Like, like Just like the mom who helped him with his uh, volcano <laughs> at, at, at science class or whatever. Um, but like everybody, you know, Dave Gems, age 14, everybody was older than me. And so, like, I knew what I had to work up to to even get to this level. But there are mysterious pages by professionals, and Ralph is never mentioned wow. in, in the in the text here. Maybe it's in the index, but, like, I saw this page, and on the channel, I was recalling this book, not knowing what the title was, completely forgot him. Like, it has vintage Eisner when he was a kid. It has this, like, first-person shooter image of uh, that's done by Richard... Corbin oh. mowing a bunch of dudes down. I don't know what the comic is. Like, what is it? Everybody was... When you ask those questions, everybody's talking about fucking bullshit. Oh, it's Den. <laughs> and it's like, you, why, how are you just saying words? It's and very you true. You know what the fuck you're talking about. And then uh, there's a page two. And, but somebody out there, some anonymous kayfaber who, whose name I just do not recall, was like, it's comics for fun and profit. I Googled it. I'm like, you're fucking right. Grab the, the first copy I could find. But it has two pages of, of what is Ralph in here. Look at that one. Man. Somebody colored it with markers. But this is my yeah, introduction. Uh, I've I've always wanted to see this comic. And it wasn't until we were in the midst of making the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel that somebody was like, dude, it's Ralph. And it freaking rules. 
And I got to give shouts to Ethan Spaulding, who sent this copy of uh, Richard Corbin's complete works from from Catalin. It has Ralph and it has a, a smattering of uh, his other undergrounds like the uh, Rats in the Walls and his Magnus Robot Fighter story uh, from the undergrounds. But Jimmy... Oh, picked, yeah. That, Jim, that, that, that Magnus one just really freaked me out. <laughs> <laughs> Where that robot is just snapping his arms like, oh, I thought there were, you know, implants. It's like, oh, my God. Look at Magnus. I've never seen anything like that. You know? Just tearing a dude up. And then he's sitting there, and he knows that the robot or the android, whatever, is like is like having it with his girlfriend, and he's like armless and legless, like, and they're kind of like making him watch, maybe. Yeah, there he is. <laughs> you space. know, oh my god! <laughs> and there's a robot cucking him out. Little did I know that later Frank Miller would draw me in Sin City, and I'd end up like. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, you got Ralph off the newsstand. Yeah, I've still got my copy. It was like one of my Bibles when I was, when I was uh, the same one you have there. I, I, I mean, I looked at the cover, and you know, it doesn't really say much to me because it's not the way it's printed. It's so dark. Um, and I got this in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, of all places. I mean, I was, I was still in high school, and I didn't really read underground comics. I mean, you know, I was a Marvel guy, and you know, and and, and I had seen a couple images printed somewhere i think it was in maybe buyer's guide or something and it was and wow this was and this guy had this this comic uh, at this this little at one newsstand in town near the train tracks and he was a he was a college kid and he was a big comics fan he actually went to comics convention the first guy i ever met that went to a comic convention and he uh showed me this thing and i was like oh my god Cause for me i looked at some of the undergrounds and it was too you know cartoony for me or too i don't know i mean i wanted straight action whatever and this was it and it's you know just tons and tons of it we're talking 1971 here ripoff press is the publisher of this uh, original version and i think for the purposes of the video we'll take a look at the actual catalan book that's in color because from this distance yeah uh, the the comic is very dark very muddy and yeah, it, I, I have i have this version and this is from France, and I got this. Was the only American comic book I bought when I went to France the first time, and it's it's an oversized, and it's 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 the whole comic. I mean, it's in black and white, I mean, oversized. And it's just beautiful. Are you saying that that's in English, or it's translated no, no, into no, French, it's, but it's, it's from an English person? No, no, it's 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 a. It was printed by the Humanoid Associates. And they did like three of these. They did one, I think, on uh, where well, they did uh, Cobalt 60. They did this one and maybe one other. Maybe it was a Wrightson one. But no, it, they're all, it's all in French. Okay. Because I was about like, to uh, have to scoop one of those up. If you can find it, because I mean, you know, just for the art. Like, yeah. yeah. So right off the bat, let's jump into things, man. Page one, the story of Ralph. You get uh, a couple of paragraphs about uh, the the land, the, the the climate of the culture. You see the there's like two panels here, basically, man. It's not off yonder. It's the wagon kind of approaching, and then you have this kind of elder and the girl talking. Um, cuts to modern day. She has a pet pup. And this guy's trying to swoon her, man. Going to show her, instead of like, you know, going to the movie theater. Let's go to the old wizard, man. He's going to show us some tricks. <laughs> and when you get it, catch a look at that guy. I believe uh, it's also worth noting that uh, as per all information I could find online, they say that Richard Corbin did color this. There's no credits with anybody else throughout wow. this. So so that makes me comfortable also um, agreeing that like may, maybe this is Corbin. It's not his traditional uh approach but there are certain things like having a red and green eyeball that feels like something richard corbin will do and i do get the sense that some of these other choices are, are corbin choices for sure the line work is so fine early you know like, like like in this story throughout yeah like i don't know what he's drawing with exactly but it is very very fine lines um you talked about choosing the color version because the black and white's a little bit dark on yeah. screen and it's it's ink on newsprint so you're getting dot gain in that original printing and combine that with a bunch of these little fine lines and pretty soon that hatching becomes black 
it becomes very dark. But the fine line work is, uh, I think it's noteworthy because I think of him as making a little bigger marks uh, later on in his career. But here it is just, it, it's that enthusiasm I think young cartoonists have. You know, there's so much energy in these drawings. Our videos are brought to you by the comic books that we make uh, in stores now. Hulk Grand Design just recently released. Uh, what else do you got uh, coming Street soon? Angel. Street Angel Princess of Poverty is my next book coming out later this spring. You can pre-order that now from Image Comics. There's also Street Angel Deadly Squirrel Live. Together, those books will comprise the complete Street Angel library at this point. So for all you completists out there that want all the Street Angel add Street Angel Princess of Poverty to your list, and The Plain Janes, first young adult graphic novel available wherever graphic novels and books are bought and sold. And you can join me on patreon.com slash jimrug to see lots more of my work, originals, download out-of-print zines, and mini-comics, and see what I am working on next. Big announcement coming soon. I am chomping at the bit, and some of you know what it is because you have the Google fingers, but I just need things to be a little bit more put together a little bit more tight before I speak about it. Big news coming soon. Can't wait to tell you about that. But right now, Red Room Crypto Killers issue one and two are being offered to your local comic shops. Uh, so go ahead and put in those pre-orders. Also, go to your local comic shop. And we have put together an incentive uh, program with uh, the Red Room issues. It is it is a limited time offer. Your shop knows what it is, but you have a chance of getting some of the Red Room variant covers that you did not get. We sat on a little surplus of them because just when you hit the button to print something, there's a little overprinting. So these comics cannot be sold in a traditional way. It has to, it has to be done in this other kind of way. Your shop is familiar with doing it. They do it with Image Comics fairly regularly. And we have this surplus stock that is very, very limited. Go to your shop. There are two or three different plans that your shop can participate in to get these Red Room comics. But grab the new uh, Crypto Killers issues. It is the 10-year anniversary of Hip Hop Family Tree. Four volumes of that, three volumes of X-Men Grand Design. There's WYSIWYG. I'm serializing the new Red Room stuff on my Patreon. And the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel has a Patreon account. And the King Kayfabers get all of our videos before anybody else mitigates the Kayfabe effect. Uh, makes it possible for you to get the comics before anybody else and uh, that aftermarket can get pretty pricey now that we are done paying the bills let's get back to the video god can he draw animals I mean, well he can draw anything I mean, that was the thing about him he could draw and going through this and thinking about your work jeff it kind of all makes sense in terms of like so much imagination and it's over the top imagination uh, so I imagine like getting a hold of this during a formative period, that's that's going to infect you for the future. Yeah, I, I you know I I I don't, I don't have half some of it. I tried I tried to to ink like him, but the, I mean it just you know, it was just beyond me. But but what my takeaway was with him was the storytelling and also just the themes and the action because i mean as, as you get into this they're all pointed out there's things that really stuck with me and to this day but my gosh it's yeah. a very expressive animal that we see too you know light yeah. playing having fun very dog-like but also that viciousness available uh, right. whenever you need it. it makes me wonder if he had a german shepherd around yeah, the time I, of this I, book i was thinking the same thing and the dog has it has it has emotion on its face i mean it always it's not just a copied from a photograph it's, it's and he chose to do it like when you bring up storytelling this this page really uh is appropriate man you got the dog looking in this window you got your wizard you got a you know the the wizard with this very clear garb that's the same garb that's playing with this cat then you get to like marry all the images man of there's dog and wizard watching uh but you got to remind the reader that these two people are in that uh space as well you have your transformation sequence, and then uh, shit, shit, shit's going crazy. I love that he turns the cat into a bat. I bet. I guess he was a dog guy. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> These legs right I, here feel like. The, I love the inbred guy, the the, the, the the aristocrat that comes. He's just like a like an inbred aristocrat. <laughs> <laughs> These legs feel like Frazetta to me, man. Uh, there was uh, like that's the famous uh, weird, weird science fantasy cover. I believe like when one of the Guys are getting knocked off the ledge. There's some like twisty legs mm -hmm. that are very, very similar in, in pose here. And then uh, it, it was David Cho on the channel who described uh, Richard Corbin's artwork as being quote unquote horny. 
<laughs> so, so let's get there. <laughs> and I, I had and I got this thing, and I was probably thirteen, maybe fourteen. You are a Catholic schoolboy. Yes, in Catholic school, and I had to hide it. I hid it because I, I bought it, but I got, I got, but you know, I was like, oh my god, you know, I mean, he's got these like Russ Meyer girls in here. <laughs> <laughs> and the first one of the first panels I saw is the one that is the the yacht, and at one point I'd only seen that, and I thought, well, it's about a little girl, because <laughs> in that drawing she looks like a, a like a little girl to me. Right. And then I saw the other, I was like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a lady, and it, it is uh, a Richard Corbin comic, so we do have to get her naked, and yeah. uh, frol <laughs> frolicking in the wilderness. The framing of the dog right here, oh. with the the black of the foreground foliage really really sharp as a black and white image of it that's real real sick let's check that out real quick and the, and the whole uh you know oh you naughty dog are you watching <laughs> right it, it was on this page after seeing the cover to this one where i started getting very nervous throughout <laughs> the reading knowing that we were going to talk about this because i'm like richard what are you doing to it? like how is this story going to end richard because we just saw the transformation of the bat so we know where that's absolutely going to go at some point he does some really unusual stuff, I think, in black and white, too, in terms of composition, where, like, it's heavy blacks, but then huge amounts of negative space, white space around it. Yeah. For some reason, I, that just stands out to me. I, I don't see much work like that. It's adventurous drawing, like, showing the submerged figure with certain bits protruding. Like, that's not easy to do. Maybe we could take a look at that in the, the black and white approach as well. The uh, water the water is just fantastic on that. It it's, really is, man. You got the bubbling from the hand. Yeah. And you have different shades of gray. So her body in gray is a lighter gray than, you know, behind her in that water. Really, really smart. It's it's incredibly, you know, it's very erotic. I mean, incredibly erotic, this thing. As to me, as a you know, 13 year old, it's still, it's like, she really looks like she's enjoying herself. <laughs> and, and so was I, as I was looking at her. Right. And it's the, it's the exact move that's required for a story like this. This lady is having, you know, peace and tranquility. So let's upset that on this page and kind of flip her whole world upside down with the invading demon horde. So uh, which, which asks the question, because you think you're in this medieval setting, you think, and then all of a sudden these Nazi demons show up with tanks. It's like, well, what, what, what in this world? What? Where's there? Where's the cutoff point? Did they come from another dimension? I don't know if they explain it or not, but it's like well, they all have, you know, they all have this higher technology, whereas you know the the humans are all still, you know, in the in the dark ages. I thought that, that was really funny. Unhinged like imagination. Elf, elf quest yeah. a, a decade yeah. early. I was thinking of uh, of 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 Tolkien, but t pushing it further. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this other species, they, they, they got armaments, man. It's one of the really neat things about this story is that sense of world. You yeah. know, like it is, it does feel epic because you have this whole strange world where stuff has obviously gone a little differently than our Earth. Yeah. But there are things we recognize, like those tanks don't look like science fiction tanks. They look well, like no, no, tanks those, out those of our world. Tanks. Yeah, I, I bet he had some model kits. Because those things are, are really accurate, and I mean, he, he's changed things about them. But I, I just love that. I thought that, of course, demons would, you know, copy, uh, you know, World War II German Nazi uh, Gestapo outfits. Uh, the he the d world. he he kind of makes some Keystone cops also. They're like real real dad. They have this high technology, but they're also dolts. Uh, and in very rapid succession, man, oh. maybe four or five pages into this thing. He's separating the dog from the girl, and they're not going to get back together for quite a while. No, but they do get back together. <laughs> Tell you, man, I'm like, is the, is the red rocket going to come out? Because like, oh, that might just be too much. And of course, they're going to assume that the dog is the cause of the trouble, which yeah. is, which is some some. That's a good story story turn. Because I'm sure, even as a kid, when you were reading this, you're like, no, not the dog. It's it's demon hordes from Germany or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> From medieval Germany. Or Russia now, maybe. When he shows these kind of uh, tank maneuvers, it really feels like he's he's like, he's now, Richard Corbin is projected into this world, and now he's playing Risk or something, like, 
totally mapping out military strategy in two panels. I recently went through that Alan Moore masterclass. Yeah. And this feels like stuff that Alan Moore talks about when you're creating these worlds and really trying to think about the details of those worlds. Texture, I think he calls it, but it makes it very believable. And it feels like you say, Ed, Corbin is in this world now. And what does a tank look like rolling across a prairie or, or tall grass? It's, there you go. That is just so brilliant the, 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 that shot with them going through, making the trails through the grass it's just uh there's a it made me think of there's a, a, a i think it's i think it's john borman did a I think it's john borman did a film with lee marvin called uh prime cuts and there's a big chase through a wheat field where they're getting chased by this one of those uh harvesting machines and it, it's, it's all like you just see the trails of the leads as they're running through the cornfields being attacked by this gosh to be able to do that and it's it seems like it's so hard in such a small panel wow also noteworthy too that he created a uh, kind of false language for the, the the demon culture you know they're they're speaking to each other the whole time and he's just using you know familiar roman characters but then adding weird umlauts and and uh, extra bits to go along with it. And when they exclaim, he'll put some typography and, and paste up uh, in, into the mix. Yeah, great use of lettering, you know, like different treatments for your lettering to have that emphasis, to have, uh, you know, like a musical incantation whenever we have our wizard. You know, really, he's using all of these tools. And you guys mentioned Russ Myers, I think like Roger Corman. It feels like um, these are things that you might see thematically in a movie from this time period, but you'd never be able to pull off the visuals with the special effects. You know, they'd, they'd probably be stop motion or something. He just makes it seamless in this comic. Chekhov's animal transformation. You don't you don't build it into act one yes. with, the, with the cat bat if <laughs> yeah. you don't uh, have some sort of payoff. The cool thing about the actual comic, can, can, can I see this, Jimmy? Uh, is with the front cover, at least, you don't really know where it's going to go. Yeah. Like, like this cover buries the lead. Like, yeah. we get that there's going to be a humanoid dog. And I guess right here, if you look, you kind of have something. But you could just imagine, I could be just like, have yeah. nothing to do with the interiors. Uh, so the cover choice here is, is, is really smart. But you don't build that in if you don't pay it off. And the conceit of this page is, this dog knows where the princess is, but he can't articulate it to us. So we're going to turn him into a human and then we're going to torture it out of them. <laughs> Their words. <laughs> well, well, when 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 I bought that comic, the guy that sold it, he kept he kept the undergrounds in a box under the counter. He would pull it out and let me look through it. And I remember going by that one several times because just because of that cover, because it didn't say anything. I mean, I had no idea until the like, point out. Well, you take a look at it. Like, oh, gee. Would you? Can you remember any of the other stuff you might have grabbed out of that box? Would 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 yeah. uh, Von Bode have been? I told, uh, rot, rot, rot. I told you that my some supporting materials. It's exciting to me to see this stuff that has survived from your childhood. It's, it's a really good condition too. Yeah, yeah, Jeff, yeah it Jeff is. Cares, man. <laughs> but you know, moving across the ocean and, and oh, over the been decades, back and like it, several times. And here's Von Bode's Yunk Waffle. I mean, that was because this this one has. Cobalt 60, which was another story. Those two stories, Rolf and Cobalt 60, immense impact on me. Yeah. But yeah, they, uh, but those are the only ones that, because he, he was always trying to get me to buy, you know, and I'm, I'm not, because I'm ignorant at that point, still am, but he had like Spain stuff like Trash Man, but it, was, it wasn't realistic enough for me. Right. Because I was still, you know, but I was still quite the Marvel guy. I remember. Uh, being exposed to the EC comics and yeah, they look good, but nah, 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 I'm not into horror stories. Nah, nah. There's no continuing characters. I wanted continuing characters or a long story. And but this thing, yeah. this is where I start getting nervous about <laughs> like, well, how is this story going to end? Because we now have our humanoid dog with a very anthropomorphic muscular male body. Uh, it could be Dan with a little bit of body hair and a dog helmet or something. It's that, it's that kind of, <laughs> and I'm like, oh no, Richard, what are you gonna do to us? These are such great panels of that transformation. Like it's almost like he's waking up, you yes. know, and looking at those former paws, now hands and just pondering like, what am I, what have I become? I imagine if, if that happened to a dog, he would look at his paws and be like, you know, I always wanted opposable thumbs. I wanted to be able to grab shit, a doorknob perhaps, and, and let myself out whenever I want to and things. So that could be a dream come true. But that is a shocked pup. Yes. You know, there's so much, like you guys said, emotion 
on the face. Open, open my own can of food. Yeah. <laughs> well, I got to ask you a question, Ed, because you seem, you seem very uh, like you'd be very, very uh, taken back if this if this at some point this animal has uh, has relations with uh, the hero. Yeah, sixty nine with the big fucking red rocket, <laughs> pink lipstick. <laughs> I had a kid in high school that came up with this scam where he would get he was a shoplifter and he would shoplift playboys and at the time that there were very many adult magazines on the stands and one was called cavalier i think the bon baudet and jeff jones they had drawings and they did yeah. they did comic strips in and uh, they would have little ads in there for eight millimeter films and uh he would send away you could send away send a quarter and they'd send you these catalogs send catalogs back and they were like hardcore pictures of these films and one of them was called Barnyard Buddies. Oh boy! And so uh, I was at this point. I wasn't too shocked because I'd seen this catalog that he had, and he would sell these things to kids. Sure, sure, that's a good <laughs> economy. I get that. And uh, you know, he'd buy them for a quarter and sell them for like a couple dollars, because they didn't ask for agents. But one of them was. Uh, so I wasn't too shocked because I was, I'd been prepared by his catalog showing. So yeah. as a kid, I was like, really? Why? Why are these? Young ladies doing this. It would be uh, funny that Barnyard Buddies, it could either be like a very hardcore film that you mail order, or it could be an underground comic. It's a perfect title. Yeah, learn or, about Barnyard Bunnies or Buddies in, uh, I believe it's Cinema Sewer. I don't remember which issue, but uh, but uh, uh, Robin, Robin, Bougie. Robin Bougie did all the work for us to, to introduce us to Bodell Jensen, uh, oh, wow. the, the, the actress wow. uh, from the uh, very famous. That is, a, that is a pool, Ed, even by cartoonist K. Vague standards. <laughs> yes, sir. And, and these things, we're, I'm digressing too much. I'll end here, but they, they, a lot of these came from Denmark. Exactly. That known Bodil, man. That ain't that ain't from Iowa, <laughs> man. And and Jensen is spelled J O E N S E N. Some bullshit like that. Oh, there you go. Okay. Boy, I, I hate to put this tag on the end of it, but what, Barnyard Buddies would also work for a kids' book. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was like, your initial uh, point. Or, no, <laughs> or a cartoon from Warner Brothers or, or Terry Tunes. Anyway. We have to get our pup out of bondage, and uh, that's another one of those great panels. And and that is your cover image, basically, man, with the, with the pup inside of the satanic yeah. pentagram occult symbol. But he's now free. It's such a great uh, freeing panel, too, because it makes total sense. Like, oh, I've got hands now, and it's just a simple loop around my neck. I can get out of this. It's almost like the uh, your your wizard does not consider this once right. he turns into the human dog. <laughs> We may not be uh, ready to handle him. Yeah, yeah. I think I like see the uh, the the incantation got like got like stopped halfway. So like it was just like we're going to turn him into just like some douchebag. Mm. See, that's funny because I it's been so long since I've read this thing. My memory of it was that they captured the dog and I go, we got to send somebody to rescue the girl. So let's turn the dog into this this warrior and her being you know a man or woman's best friend. He'll go and he'll fetch her and bring her back. So, I, I'd forgotten that it wasn't that what that wasn't their intent at all. Man, it speaks to the story. Like this is a heck of a story, and to be able to remember it that way, and and it's viable. Yeah. Like it does does feel like you could have made a B movie out of this. You could make you could probably adapt it today and yeah. make a fun movie out of oh, it because it's it so thought out. It's it really works. It's so rare back back in those days of the undergrounds that there would be one big story. Mm -hmm. uh, in inside of an issue is largely anthologies. Uh, the people who were doing the the sort of big willy underground comics of the day, they were not inspired by genre stuff. They were the the children. They were the readers of the John Stanley Little Lulus and Walt Kelly and Kurtzman's Mad. And so that's the format that they all had in mind. And that's the comics that, that that's how the comics were reflected. Uh, with a bunch of, you know, maybe four different short stories, like an issue of Matt or something. Uh, Corbin, yeah, maybe he came from that a little bit, but he's a genre guy through and through, from from, from the womb to the tomb. And uh, playing with this kind of thing. I often wonder at, at the time when it came up, because it was so different from all the other artists working in underground comics, is if there wasn't any sort of like, any sort of like reflection on him being, well, he's a little too mainstream. Because I mean, it isn't, but in some ways it is, in that it can relate to a you know Wally Wood, Al Williamson, Frank Rosetta, that level of because the drawing and the other stuff is, is wasn't there wasn't that wasn't their their intent. Yeah. And I wonder if he was like, oh well, you know, he's he's like 
if they thought he was too commercial. We did a video so, some time back. Uh, it's the it's the sort of famous comics journal cover that's a jam piece between uh, Robert Crumb and Gil Kane. You know where they're back to back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we we did a video on that conversation that was uh, a transcription from a comic con that uh, Gary. Roth moderated at like you know Dallas Fantasy Fair one one year or something. They bring up Richard Corbin because you got Gil Kane, you have Robert Crumb. That seems like a very logical kind of like right Cro Magnum stage in between the two. And and uh, there is there is some talk and language about like what uh, Robert Crumb thought thought of Richard Corbin. I don't mm -hmm. uh, fully remember. We probably talk about it in the mm -hmm. episode, but you could certainly read it in that in that interview. What the underground guys thought of. Richard Corbin's comics, and I, I actually believe the word horny came up in that uh, conversation as well. You know, the other thing that I would take away from this line of conversation is this could have been a template for um, an earlier creator-owned, like, like how can genre artists use underground comics? You yeah. know, what was set up there? It would have been amazing if some of these guys would have gone in this direction, if we'd have had, you know, Bernie Wrightson's and people that would have gone into the self-publishing and found a potential audience that way without ever having to go through the editorial limitations of right. like newsstand distribution. Um, it's really interesting that, that this direction in comics did not develop. Right, well, it took, it took some time. We'll say and that. I think at this time he was he had that job he was working, uh, he had a job in an advertising or some sort of art job in in Kansas City I think that's where he's living, and I just wonder I think if he was doing this on the side is this is something that he just did, and then contacted you know rip uh, you know rip off press and say hey do you want to do this or do they say hey we want you to do I, I wish I knew the history of this thing because I mean he's never I mean he's never been a really good as far as I know interview with. Corbin, because we, so we're really, except the, the his art process, right? To me, it's just I it 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 made my head want to explode. Right? He's I just, uh, he he, can, he established himself in fanzines and starting yeah. in around 1968, yeah, and those would be genre magazines, genre books, and stuff where he's drawn big muscle guys, all that sort of thing. So and that's where I that's where I first saw him. He he did some stuff. There used to be a magazine about. Edgar Rice Burroughs. It was called Herbdom. It was printed by a guy called Camille Cazetius Jr. And it had a great, got a great logo uh, drawn by um, a Crinkle and um, Ray Crinkle. And he had like a, a drawing of a, a, a Thark from the Princess of Mars. And it was like the weirdest thing I'd ever seen. I go, who is this guy? And then I'd see his stuff. Like he did a couple drawings of Conan that were in the buyer's guide when it used to be like a newspaper in the, in the sixties. But and then, you know, then I found this, thing. this panel, I love so much because this is your exhausted Rolf dreaming nightmare dreams. And it's incredible to think of like, suddenly, you know, he's in this semi human form. It's all happened quickly. His love of his life has been kidnapped by demons. And now he's collapsed and passed out, exhausted. And this is his nightmares of like trying to organize the last, uh, you know, waking hours of his life up to this point. I could have I could have done pages of this. I would have been uh, into into looking at this. But if you look at the actual drawing, like you get to see Corbin, how do you express a nightmare? Yeah. In a, in a new dog human mind, it's a little <laughs> bit of a different drawing style than what you see in the rest of the book, which I just love. Yeah. The, like, well, how, well, how, would a, how does a dog see us? See, it's funny. The art style reminds me of another guy who kind of felt oh. like his feet were half in the underground, half in a more mainstream sensibility. Was that dude uh, Jackson with an X? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But now we're getting to the fun stuff because we have our full anthropomorphic dog who is on a mission and he is now stalking uh, these demon Nazi guys. We, we see the infiltration. Metal Gear Solid, man. His little ears popping up in shadows as guys are cleaning their guns. We see the inside of the tank. Great illumination there. <laughs> yeah. And uh, as you turn to the page, this is where we're getting into the Keystone Cop, H <laughs> Hogan's Heroes version of these demon Nazi guys. You know what? Panel before that, though. This is such a great menacing, like in black and white. It's a nightmare with those little tiny white eyes sticking yeah. out. 
some parallels between the dog and the and the demon right scary there. face. Look at yeah. that. Uh, like it like absolutely panel to panel. And then you get those sort of well elderish guys standing in a <laughs> in a line. Such fascinating proportions. It's like five heads tall and you know the the top torso is the exact size as as the legs. Also very noteworthy that Corbin is not afraid to do these panels that read down. Mm -hmm. You know, we saw a couple examples of that earlier, but on this spread, you see two versions of that. Yeah, it's a pretty dense story throughout. You know, it feels like you've got a graphic novella here, uh, you know, in terms of packing in not just the full issue's length, but also pretty dense pages. Yeah. Um, you know, you're looking at 10 panels a page or so on this spread. There's a dog underneath the tank watching stuff go down. That's a, that's a hard image to compose. Mm, yeah. With all the elements required. Yeah. <laughs> There's this one piece where it talks about like uh, Ralph is intrigued by the 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 hand weapons or something, and and now <laughs> now we got our fucking dog who's behind some kind of pillbox or something. Rest his eyes on a fucking bazooka, <laughs> and now we have the greatest underground co butch underground comic. <laughs> To ever come out of San Francisco, I, I, lo I love that he knows how to use this stuff. <laughs> oh yeah, it's like gun. Yeah, sure. It's all intuitive once you get those thumbs. I'm telling you, man. And here he is. Oh, he he shoots it. He could use it, but like he uh, he didn't quite know exactly how it works, so he just uh, shoots a warning shot. Another one of those great reaction emotion panels, like what is this? And he's thing? crying. You know, like the the onomatopoeia is the, is a dog really? yelp. <laughs> yeah, big ears. That bazooka is gonna gonna ring in those big dog ears. <laughs> but whoa, well, Reggie, <laughs> you don't get any of that with ball. <laughs> but that's not all because uh, that was too small of an armament. So now we have Ralph commandeering basically the tank gun. <laughs> he learns to drive. You know, it's probably from <laughs> relettering uh, a little bit for this. I see. Yep. Kind of, kind of strange, you know, his lettering's so strong throughout. Always makes me wonder whenever an artist decides to make a change like that. You know, yeah, something he was unhappy with. I'm glad you caught that. That, de that demon up in the left corner, it almost it almost looks like a, I don't know if it's Aztec or Mayan design. The right. nose lines, it's really... You're right. It looks like a bar relief on the side of yeah. a pyramid or something. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Speaking of bar relief... The use of the, use of the lettering, which I, I don't... hard, I did it once in hard boil, but tried to anyway... But, you know, using it as a directional thing is just amazing. Yeah, yeah. Seeing these tank shreds, man, this this is like uh -huh. the first place I would see this would be like in Joe Kubert War Comics. Maybe it was in the Frontline Combats and stuff, but the, uh -huh. the, the way the treads are drawn here is so sharp. Maybe Wally Wood did that stuff in some of the war books or something. Um, a lot of the sound effects do call back to me, uh, like EC Comics and Mad Magazine, you know, with the big heavy. Yeah, yeah. I was looking at that one. A co you know, quite a few of these. Even these are small, but it still has that feeling of those sound effects being something. That's the first place my mind goes. Sure. And I wonder. I wonder if Otomo ever saw this because I mean, the, the you know the the uh, the clouds and the explosions have that same kind of feeling. The use of negative space to create a, to. Uh, give the idea of, of power and light and explosion it's just no stuff in the middle of it it's just it's so blinding and so powerful it's just uh, negative space that is just like everything's disintegrated that's within that that area so many big moments man but also so many panels on each page oh and here's that page this is it ed the first person shooter gimmick man and so there's a lot going on actually because like the uh it's not just, you know, a statted image or in moving the thing, but like the tank is actually uh, advancing. So we're getting more and more of the dog each panel as he points it at dudes first, then cuts them down. But there are dudes on the right as well. So we got to get those bastards too. And of course, when he shoots them, this guy's going to be aware. So there's one blaster shot as he gets cut in half. <laughs> That's fantastic. 
storytelling. How much of that did you work out as a kid, Ed? Like whenever you found that, page? it was so clear. Yeah, it was. I mean, that's what was exciting about it. Was like, I need. What is this comic? This is so evocative. Like, you want to know what happens before. You want to know what happens after. Absolutely. And also, uh, this is not the kind of stuff you would see in, say, a Joe Kubert War comic. No. You know, this is maybe going to happen off camera. We're, we're used to like GI Joe cartoons, probably around the time that you're looking at this page. Um, yeah, that's that's very graphic compared to the norm. And the, the level of violence, the level of violence that he had, yeah, really affected me. I, I, yeah, it's all and, it's all well choreographed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the gosh, the guy. Jeff, had you seen anything like like let's say this is R-rated, you know, violence and stuff? What are you seeing at you know age twelve or thirteen when you get hold of this comic in the early seventies? I, you know, I I was actually terrified by violence. I. I went to see uh, Bonnie and Clyde and uh, by Arthur Penn. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but yeah. I'd never seen anything that violent and bloody in my life. I mean, you'd see innocent people getting shot in the face. And at the end, when they they do that, what, what you know, Sam Ray would call a chicken dance, when they're getting shot up in that car, I was terrified. I was, I mean, it was like a horror film. It was a horror film to me. And uh, I come, come I said this I came out of the theater because my dad picked me up at the at the theater. I had, you know, in those days you'd call and they'd come in and pick you up at the theater and kind of pick you up. And the first thing I said to him, I remember this day, I said, "I'm never going to break the law as long as I live." <laughs> I figured that's how you ended up shot to pieces in a car. And then even the trailers for the Wild Bunch freaked me out. Really freaked me out because it just. And so you know, I, I don't know where where I became uh, sort of. Uh, Immune to, <laughs> immune to it. Maybe it was from seeing some of that. Actually, it probably came from seeing the Japanese, the uh, the baby cart movies, because but th those were so cartoonish in their violence that it maybe it sort of like was a a, a COVID uh, shot for me. It's just like <laughs> <laughs> geysers of blood in the baby cart flicks, man. This last panel before the concluding uh, chapter, <laughs> like if you don't continue your reading experience after seeing that. There's no hope for you, man. Close the mag. Go, go back. Go read your Jerry Conway Spider Man's, man. It's, it's over <laughs> Pose, for you. Posing those bodies on the tank. And yeah. <laughs> Another just... minor change here is adding that, uh, like a title, a chapter card. You know, it's not a lot, but it does create that conclusion. You know, it's a part three of this story. Yeah, I think that what we're working with here with these color pieces, it might have been serialized in heavy metal. Uh, in 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 three different small that, that would make sense. I really love this of like the dust coming across the horizon. Very yeah. subtle, but one more of those details it gives you a physical reality. But that establishing shot with the island of the, oh my god, just I, the sense of of depth and geography is just amazing. And and this is a, that kind of shot that uh, I, so you see plenty of that in Shaolin Cowboy, Cruel to Be Kin. Yeah. Certainly, fighting the, the the chicken monster, like with all of the plateaus and cacti and tumbleweeds and stuff in that desert setting, that this is not easy stuff to draw. No, it's interesting. It's epic as uh, established by setting, by landscape. Yeah, yeah. It's all. I mean, if you've ever watched, occasionally they'll come on the the John Ford films in Monument Valley. Just the sense of scale that. Uh, he has here, and uh, Giraud had when he did yeah. Lieutenant Blueberry, just, you know, guys riding across this endless landscape with just so powerful. I mean, it, you know, and it's not, you didn't really see that. You hadn't seen that in American comics in a long time before this, because, I mean, you had Foster would do it, and uh, Raymond to a certain extent, but this, this is like... And the same thing, Otomo is the same thing. He can, Absolutely. He can do. Yeah. Now, that whole middle section, that was just fighting. <laughs> Had nothing to do with uh, what the true plot yeah. of the story is, which is we got to retrieve the princess. Uh, and now we have a very uh, <laughs> we have a very capable dog man going towards her. <laughs> and I am like, oh, no, I, Richard, what are you what are you going to do to us? Are you going to get our channel flagged? <laughs> Barnyard Buddies is still a possibility. <laughs> it absolutely is, but because he's because I mean now he's now the I hero. He's, he's I wanted him to get with the girl. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's uh you know he's John Wayne. He's Sylvester Stallone. 
yeah, he's rat, yeah. I love this this sequence here as the tank rumbles along. You see those like further desiccated corpses from <laughs> yeah. a distance. It looks like oh, the homies are coming. Go go uh, draw a bath for the boys, man. They're coming home. The line work reminds me a little bit of Mobius. It's a it's a lighter hand. And I love, again, whenever Corbin kind of stretches in some of the drawing, because here's another one of those drawings that it goes in a different direction. It's a little bit, I don't know, heavier instruments, maybe, you know, harder drawing or something. It's cool to see those variations. And our guys, and, but, go ahead, Jeff. No, I was just going to say this, you know, this, this French edition that, that, that I showed you, this, this and Cobalt 6, they were handpicked by, by, by Mobius because he loved these things. Wow, wow that's so cool. He was cool. One, of the, one of the guys that... Uh, you know, founded um, Mental Herlant, the Humanoid Associate. So, yeah, he loved uh, and Our dog learned earlier that you can <laughs> toss these gas cans and make explosions happen. So playing the hits, why do it once if you could do it twice? Very I wonder if you had to fight the instinct to chase the bag, you like to fetch it. <laughs> <laughs> the... <laughs> Very manga-esque mark making in our explosion. Yeah. And then unmistakable uh, Corbin right here with these big thick lines and the lettering and that kind of squat element. Having the helmet on our guy is just such such a great touch. There's images like this make me wonder if like this is the thing that's first drawn in a sketchbook and now you have to like it's such an evocative image that you now have to like try to figure out how to make a story around that kind of an image i love to think that that's the first image of the story <laughs> <laughs> what happened before well, what happened I after think, it <laughs> i think he, uh, uh, he sculpted a lot of stuff and i think he may have i wonder if he sculpted this dog and some of these guys yeah for the lighting of it and just the drawing because i mean it's or like you say he probably had a German shepherd or oh, that that fourth shot is a key I was like I, I, I don't care she looks like a demon that, <laughs> <holy> <laughs> yeah like what is even happening you know what? I, I think it shows a little more clearly in the black and white the color makes this very solid but it's you know it's clearly it's her gyrating but here it's a little bit different I think effect than in the black and white Okay, this is the girl. She, right. she got a helmet on or something? Mm, I think that's a demon <laughs> skull with maybe a head Yeah, well, head there's dress. some kind of a headdress. Yeah, I, I, I just, what do they call that? Motorboating? Okay, I, I get it. Like, you know what? For some, <laughs> forgive me, but I forgot that every female in a Richard Corbin comic has the same bust line. I, I was thinking that that was our princess lady. <laughs> we are looking at a Richard Corbin comic. It is not a princess. Okay, I get it. I get it completely. Uh, because our princess is here, you know, you know what it is. It's the panel to panel where I'm like, is this her? No, but I, I get it. I get it now. Playing with some some other screen tone. Take those tail feathers. Yeah, I was trying to figure this out about screen tone, and and I guess maybe it is no, because I, it's I repeated. That. Yeah, I have that tone. Although it's different here. I wonder if it's a splatter or something. It's very organic. Yeah, and no, I have that exact screen for sure. This is like a pebbly kind of a. Uh, screen yeah, because it's all yeah. one value like looking you can't you can't over, spatter one value yeah looking at this oversized thing it's 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 yeah it's not a splatter it's a yeah. we're getting some really great color uh on these these pages man with these blues and greens against the oranges that like this is classic corbin color choices with the purples against the oranges and things yeah and green all your secondary colors yeah dominating there the girl's reasonably capable man so, you know, she's getting overpowered by this big muscle guy, but she's pulling some gimmicks and, and cracking him on his headpiece. I, I just love that, you know, it's kind of from the, 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 man who, uh, the man who knew too much, the Hitchcock film. Like, she screams, he hears her, and he, like, gives his dog howl, and then yeah. she goes, oh! Because <laughs> 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 he didn't change that much. And it becomes a werewolf story, man. Uh, yeah. The dude is pumping back to frickin' kick a field goal using his head, but Ralph pops in. Like, that's a that's a good three-panel sequence where, you know, this could be the last time she sees Ralph alive. But no, Ralph is very capable, overpowers that, the guy. That whole page, I have been trying to do my entire life. The whole, I'd never seen, wow, it's Kung Fu. And he's fighting this guy in this sequential fight scene. I was like... That kind of stuff really got me. And I was like, my God, 
and he's so good at it. I've never seen anybody. That's the first time I'd ever seen martial arts in a comic book. Right. Man, I wonder how influential that is. Whenever you think about guys like the Paul Galaces and, and Frank Miller Frank on Miller, Daredevil, yeah. you know, the, the fighting in comics really changes from that Kirby style of like just haymakers and explosions. And this this is one of those early choreographed fights. Like, I wonder if there's one before it, and I wonder how many people saw this and took stuff out of it. Right. I'd see it in some of the earlier French and some of the Argentinian comics. Uh, there's a guy named, I think his name is... Castillo, and I'm, I've mentioned him before. He, he he did this fight. He did a comic, a western called Randall, and there's a whole fight scene in it that I saw in uh, Maurice Horn's history of comic strips, and it's just like guys throwing punches back and forth. And that was another. I was like, I want to be able to do that someday. Just uh, I grew up watching. Also, they, they used to show on television these old movie serials, and they would they didn't have any gunfights, and they're just guys like beating each other's brains out. <laughs> Very influenced by that. And uh, this is the part where I'm like, there's only one way this story can end, uh, but it is a young, more reserved Richard Corbin because hmm. you do not, unlike Den, you do not see a big salami <laughs> or sausage <laughs> flapping around as uh, Ralph. He, he, keeps the, he keeps the pants on that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Every now and then, then you get a good shadow that maybe uh, his third <laughs> leg. Was <laughs> yeah. that his tail or? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, nice. Ralph nice. saves the day, man. Dispatches a bunch of punk ass demon Nazis. Blows <laughs> the joint up as you should. And, and look, like they jump into like a U-boat. And you see the U-boat make make its way out of there. Great reflection on the water. Because that, that 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 roar, that the, the lettering, that looks like to that looks to me like um, he didn't do it, but Mobius lettering. Oh, you're right. Yeah, it's that very thin line that Mobius would employ. Yeah, yeah. even the kaboom, because I've seen it in the inkle. I love the reflection. Yeah, it's it's amazing. He knows, he knows how to pilot boats as well. <laughs> right. Listen. The beauty of comics. There goes your inbreed. <laughs> With his side part. <laughs> not one wasted moment, not one wasted character. These guys are established early on. You know, they're they're back waiting. They're the chicken hawks, man. They're, they're the dreamers. You know, it would be real nice to have the princess back, but Ralph's the one doing the action. How much Sam Keith do you see in this character Absolutely. design and the shadows and, Absolutely. and wrinkles and everything? Absolutely. And, and Sam Keith would have proportions... Uh, on his characters that are squat in the same way with the big head and cartoony faces and things, man. Like, Richard Corbin creates a lot of, for lack of a better word, permission for artists to go down this kind of road because this would not... Richard, at this level, with all the waxing that we're doing all over it, if he would have sent three of these pages to Marvel for a submission, they would say, get the fuck out of here, you gotta work on your anatomy and shit like that. You know what I mean? Like, See, you know, that, you... that's, that's really funny to me because, I mean, as, as a kid, or even, well, I was like, I was 12, 13, 14, whenever this, I got this, but I always thought this, all that stuff was accurate. Because I thought, if you're in a comic book, you know what you're do doing. So I would try to, like, draw it. I never realized, it never seemed out of proportion to me. <laughs> to this day, it doesn't because, well, it's Richard Corbin. I'm, I'm a really odd guy. I, even Kirby, I mean, I used to try to draw, like, Kirby. It was like, well, that's how anatomy is. I, I had no idea that it's just, you know, it is kind of anatomy, but it's filtered through Jack's. In this, in this case, I mean, the, it's all there. It's just in weird proportions, I guess, because somebody I was talking with Steve Scross once. And go, well, you know, Corbin is weird proportions. And I was like, what? <laughs> I mean, so, you know, I'm 60 some years old and I still think it looks accurate to me. So maybe that might explain all my drawing problems. Comics are so strange for that. I'd be curious to like take a few of these Richard Corbin figures and actually kind of graph them out and see like how many heads tall is this actual character. And it wouldn't surprise me if this is as close to accurate as I, the stuff that's like the Marvel superhero, you know, eight and a half, nine heads tall. They're exaggerated. But I wonder if they're exaggerated almost in opposite directions right. where like somewhere in the middle is your accurate figure. Like, yeah. These aren't that weird. They're weird from a Marvel house style True. or a DC house style. I mean, I would notice, for instance, you know, 
Hakuto no Ken, Fist of the North Star, where they have Ken standing there. And he's like 20 heads yes. tall. And, 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 uh, and 16 of those heads are legs. <laughs> he's really kind of, kind of pushing it. I st- I, when I worked at Hanna Barbera, we worked with this guy that would draw figures like that. And it was generally, it was women. And uh, he would always try to, my boss would come in, this is character design, and the boss would come in and go, Hey, Curtis, oh, Curtis, you know, that figure is a little, she's a little long, a little long, her legs are a little too long. <laughs> you don't understand. She's a dancer. She's a dancer. Because <laughs> she was a dancer. Then I'd start laughing. Why are you laughing? I go, well, because someone's a dancer. They just have these long legs like like Ken. It just really could crack with that. But Corbin never it never struck me that way. It's so funny when, when like I said, when Steve Scrolls brought that up to me, I got Gosh, I get I guess he's right. I never really noticed. I always thought they were fairly hard. They just thought they had kind of large heads. As we wind things down, the tank <laughs> approaches uh, the the wizards the wizards uh, hobble, and we get two possibilities in Ralph's mind for how things are going to go down once he's reacquainted with uh, the wizard guy who turned him into this dog man. Uh, the positive uh, thought is that. Uh, because he saved the day, he's going to get the fruits of the spoils, and our wizard is going to complete the uh, spell in an accurate fashion, and uh, turn our guy into a uh, it's an Adam and Eve story or something. Uh, but then you know you got the two polar emotions on our Ralph character, and, uh, and you got the Corbin male figure, the typical heroic super be- Danish. Uh, yeah. Be- because I saw uh, the cartoon flick uh, Heavy Metal before seeing the comics, uh, the Corbin muscle guys always have the voice of John Candy in, yeah. in my mind. <laughs> that was my favorite part of that because I didn't like those, but I loved that they had Candy doing the voice. Yeah. Because it bothered me that it didn't look like Corbin, I, as I recall it. Have you ever seen Have you ever seen the Corbin little animated den film? I don't they had that. it playing at uh, Angoulême. Oh, that, yeah. That you were there? A couple years ago, yeah. yeah. They used to show it, and you could go to a, a comic convention like the Phil Suling. The that was the big show, and they would show movies, and they'd they would run they'd run it. And um, I mean, I kind of wanted to see it so bad. And uh, it was very Cherusco, was very you know heavy and the uh, the John Candy cartoon. It was the first time I ever heard of a penis uh, referred to as a dork. <laughs> you just talk about my dork is hanging out. I'm like, who? <laughs> what? <laughs> Well, that was also what we called kids. Like, oh, he's such a dork, man. Right. So now we know the et- etymology. Uh, the story ends uh, in a very uh, happy way. We get a happy ending here. Uh, for me, anyway. Maybe not for you, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> you have this this fresh hold about bestiality that I crossed many years ago, I guess. It's, it's, uh, yeah, Ed, why do you hate dogs? <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> I don't hate dogs. I love the Cartoon Escape of YouTube channel, and I feel like I feel like when I approve videos, there's there's some language in there about things that can and cannot show up on the tubes, man. But you could have a dog a dispatch of the people who do not mean the princess well, and uh, ride off into the sunset while our wizard is being a big old pussy, and like uh, the incantation language, Yog Sogoth, that's yeah. uh. H.P. Lovecraft. Yeah, yeah. It's a great detail. There's one extra page in the... Con- well, yes, I guess it's not a page, it. but it's an inside back cover that at least acknowledges the story and says it wasn't a happy ending, but you should see their kids. So uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that magic that, takes place in between those two pages. Ed. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I, I, I remember because my, my whole memory of it was, because like I say, it's been as long as I read it, was, was it that he said... And they lived happily ever after, but had very strange children. That was fun. for some reason in my head. That's that that was the last line. But the, the beauty of this comic is that is it is a complete Richard comic, written, lettered, penciled, and inked. And uh, so much of his biggest works are have like Jan Stranod mm-hmm. doing doing uh, the the writing chops and things. So it's cool to get this very early example of. You know, his complete kit and caboodle without any other editorial interference. You know, like this story has to live or die. The beats of the story have to live or die by him. If he's in the middle of Kansas City or whatever, I don't know that he has very many homies to to, to show this to, to try to like make sure that it's tight, but it all works. 
You know, there's not much wasted mo movement at all, if any. Jeff, do you remember reading the story and seeing moments of like uh, of humor and comedy in the story? Was that something you were yeah, aware well, of as yeah, a kid? Was, yeah, mostly what stuck with me was the action and the, the nudity. But yeah, the uh, you know the the this, well the stuff with especially the scene with the dog where the girls the dogs watch and the girl bathe. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny as as a kid because on top of it, it's. You know, that's what dogs do. Jeff, would there be much nudity in film uh, in 1971? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Because by then, um, it was in the early 60s, there was a film called I Am Curious Yellow, which I think is a Danish or Finnish film. And it had nudity. It was the first film, I think, that they actually, they came up with the X rating and they allowed it to be seen because they showed breasts, which as a kid growing up, uh, this, this is horrible, the racist racistness of it. They could, you could, go, they would show films in Africa, and they would have nudity of of Native Africans, and that was okay. Which you know, shows you where they think is that, but you couldn't show a white woman in the same way. You just you'd be, you know, and so they uh, that film sort of broke it broke down because I mean I don't know if you know much of the history of it, but but Russ Meyer, some of those films he made, they would show they would go from town to town and they would set up a projector and they would, they wouldn't call it. They just kind of, people just kind of knew because the cops would rate them if they actually knew. And they have some kind of, you know, regular title. Like I don't know, one was, I think the immortal Mr. T's, but and you could go and see it. It'd be like at a midnight show. And uh, I mean, I, of course I was too young for that, but I mean, I do love them, but, but yeah, around 68, you started having nudity in films and, uh, um, yeah, that's when they came up with, you know, the X, the X rating. And I mean, Myers films were coming out uh, and they were, you know, they couldn't show, they couldn't show um, pubic hair and they couldn't show penises. It wasn't until the seventies when, when Russ Myers started putting these almost Corbin S these really fake in silhouette rubber penises that were always like hanging down. And, uh, mm -hmm. but I mean, and that's what they also started, you know, I think, around, I think it was an art school when Deep Throat came out. And that was the one that really broke down the, the barriers. Yeah, it's Although, an interesting film period, that whole 70s decade. They have that uh, Easy Riders, Raging Bulls yeah, book about that time period. And with the X rating, I think it's Midnight, Midnight Cowboy gets Midnight the Cowboy X rating. Was, I was going to say. And that's that was 69, maybe, around around then, yeah, I think. Yeah, 60, 69. And, and, and uh, it was because... And then you don't see anything in that film, but they were talking about he had homosexual experiences. And so it got a hard X rating. And I mean, it. You know, I went to Catholic school and I was like, oh, my God, you know, this is like the worst thing that could happen to mankind is this film. It's like the it last vestiges the of time as, as The Graduate, which had and you didn't see her completely naked, I don't think, uh, and Bancroft. No, but, that was um, laying the groundwork but, for MILF porn, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, but, yeah. but but those yeah. movies are critically acclaimed. So, you know, that X rating didn't mean time, what still. it would go on to mean, you know, like today, like an X is just you associate it with pornography. Back then it would have been like, well, what do we do? Because here's Midnight Cowboy getting winning Academy Awards, even though it's, you know, getting this kind of rating. Um, very different than they, what it went on to mean. They, and that's when they came up with the triple X so that they could like, do, like have a differential. Right. And as soon as you put an X in it. You know, like like an IRI was, but it doesn't matter how many X's you got on there. <laughs> it's, a bad, it's a bad thing. And then there was R, which meant that you could see brief nudity. But I think I think even uh, Deliverance, which doesn't have any nudity in it, but it has that scene where Ned Beatty gets mm -hmm. raped. That was rated R. Of course, it was it was pretty violent as well. Yeah, yeah. That was yeah, a I mean, really dis that was the one I saw early on and disturbed me so. It was so nightmarish. Oh. <laughs> yeah. You got yeah, a pretty I, mouth. I, 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 I that film I thought it was such a great film and I remember I told my my cousins to, to go and see it and next time I came back to Iowa they were furious with me. <laughs> told us to go see such a thing and da 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 and I was like you know gee you know in the context I mean I read I read that novel twice and uh, it's all everything that you see in a movie happens. But there's a whole kind of final chapter, just I guess kind of like how Clockwork Orange has a whole final chapter. It's kind of different and it changes the tone of things. And, and what, what happens is the guys go back to their civilian lives, but they have this secret, which is, you know, that what happened to the guy plus like the murders that they did. 
and mm-hmm. it's like how they sort of get on with the rest of their lives. It's it's kind of that part that like you always have with movies as like a little kid. Like okay, so you, you got away from Freddy Krueger, but now what happens? Like it's that mm-hmm. bit, and and it is not a happy ending. Like their lives are freaking in turmoil. Guy becomes an alcoholic from what I remember. Another guy close to suicide. It's uh, got to be a metaphor for war at that time, and like PTSD before that was something that we that was more widely understood and you know treated and, and kinda, talked about. And they kind of hint at it with the uh, you know that sort of, and they make a movie poster out of it that at the end when the body comes up, right? And he wakes up and it's a dream. And I don't remember, you know, I think the the author is in. He's he's the sheriff at the end. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't know. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. They had him in it, and he's like, he, he's got like, well, so what? What really happened back there? You know, that's I can't remember his name. Jeff, listen, thank you so much for joining us uh, for uh, going through this masterpiece, Richard Corbin comic, Ralph. Uh, it's something that uh, that I wanted that we wanted to do with you for, uh, since we got our hands on copies. Uh, if you remember, man, before the Akira thing, we laid out a bunch of Jeff. What, what, what can we look at with you, man? Uh, and we finally got our hands on these so this is this is a dream video yeah i'm so happy to have this on the channel too just as a great comic like uh, this is a really outstanding yeah. comic yeah. I, I know i know i'm pretty sure dark horse is gonna do it yeah and, uh, uh, i think i think it's uh like you could start to pre-order these things man i think there are like two or three volumes that you could probably go on amazon right now and start to start to pre-order the complete corbin excellent yeah uh, it was a big announcement, I guess. At like maybe was it last year's San Diego or this year, last year's New York Comic Con in October, or something, something like that. Jeff, before we get out of here, let the people know when they should expect the Shaolin Cowboy Cruel to Be Kin trade paperback to hit hit the light of day. I, well, Amazon May sixteenth, so it might be out a week week before then. But May sixteenth for sure, it'll be it'll be available. And uh, it's twenty nine ninety five on Amazon. Go to your comic book store. Buy it from your comic book store if they get it. I don't know. Right. Yeah, or pre-order it from your local comic book store. Oversized hardcover with that bonus material in the back of a of an extra storyboard story. Like that is awesome. Yes. Totally. So and, and, and don't be afraid that it won't fit into your. You know, thinking, well, it don't fit on my comic book shelf. Like, oh, come on, man. Yeah, you can you can shelf it next to the grand design books. That's goddamn yeah, right, man. Yeah. The cartoonist cafe audience they they don't make those kinds of complaints. Yeah, you, That's right. You have those shelves. I mean, your, your your taste shouldn't be dictated by by size. Size doesn't matter. We'll we'll say that to all the retailers we talk to tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, thanks for joining us, sir. Thank you.